Good morning. This is the April 21st um, board meeting of the Blue Earth County Board of Commissioners. If we could stand and uh, pledge allegiance to our flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Bob, could you start us off with the agenda review? Mr. Chair and Commissioners, there are no changes to the agenda this morning. Um, I'll move, oh, Commissioner People moves the uh, agenda review. Lane Cameron uh, seconds. We've got a motion and a second. Jesse, could you call the roll, please? Commissioner People? Yes. Commissioner Purvis? Yes. Commissioner Brunder? Yes. Commissioner Landcammer? Yes. Chair Stuenberg? Yes. And then we get started off right away with uh, Mr. Phil Clausen from Human Services. Good morning, morning Phil. Phil. Morning, Phil. Oh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and Commissioners. I uh, have just one action item for you this morning and then a couple of, of informational slides um, regarding child support and our housing programs. And then I'm going to turn it over to Kelly Hader, who's here to give us an update from public health regarding the COVID pandemic. Um, the first action item is regarding the fee policy and it really is updates and changes for this coming year. Uh, it shows our billing services, the amounts we charge in the document and also a procedural guideline according to some of the rules we operate under. There is an attachment with the changes of, of the summary of the changes for this year and I'm just going to give you a couple of examples off that list. Uh, I did give a copy of the fee policy, Mr. Chair, to Jesse, if anybody wants to look at it. There is no signature line, though. So I, I'm, you're free of signatures this month, which is good. A um, couple of... And normally, you're the one that gives me the most The signatures. most, I know. I thought I, I'd even out the score a little bit. Um, this, this attachment um, really shows these changes and um, a couple of examples of the intricacies that we deal with, but page one You'll see at the kind of the end of that paragraph, it lists four of our acronyms for our programs and financial assistance, MFIP, DWP, MSA, and GA. Um, but it says we'll not charge a fee for services, but may be, ch uh, that we cannot charge a fee for services, but may be charged a copay or deductible based on their public health insurance plan. Uh, we are not able to further subsidize the copay or deductible per the Department of Human Services. So what this means is MA sets a rate, and then what we can't do is discount that rate further. And there's rules around that for these four programs. And so when we talk about the complexity of how it applies, somebody might come in and apply for this program, but also be on other programs that has a different set of rules. But I, this is a tweak, a change that we have to make sure we're saying so that we can't discount the MA rate is really what the bottom line is, is if they have a copay, they have to pay it. And so you're probably aware that we do have the ability sometime in a hardship, a lot of times with medical situations where we can waive certain fees if somebody's in a hardship situation. In this case, we can't even do that because there's, there's statute around them. And then page two and four, there's just language changes. I, I, you can certainly read those and look at those in the fee policy if you'd like. Page five, it says sliding fee will not be applied to coinsurance unless the plan meets internal revenues definition of high deductible plan. Well, we've kind of went through this ourselves as a county having a high deductible plan and there's different rules for different plans. And so in this case, they're saying that we can not really apply the sliding fee again unless it's a high deductible plan. So it's an exception. And you can ask me why it's an exception. I have no idea how these things <laughs> get done. They get, they get done you know, either at the state or federal level. And then f the last one, I'll just say to page 16, it says if a client's open to financial assistance in Blue Earth County, billing clerk will contact financial assistance case aid for income verification. If eligible, a sliding fee will be applied. So what this is, this is indicating is just a pr standard of practice that we have that a lot of times people will come in, they'll apply and not tell us where their income is and they might actually qualify for the sliding fee and we miss it. And then later on down the road, we look back, let's say there's a fee waiver request and we go, oh, they would have qualified for the sliding fee if we would have just known. So we're just kind of doing that internal 
um, step to check ourselves to see if they might be able to apply the sliding fee. So this is a lot of that complexity and you kind of get the sense too how it doesn't apply across the board and that would be my only hope as the years go by when we talk about administrative simplification that some of these rules I think they all have rhyme to their reason it's not that they don't make any sense it's just that there's so many different rules for different programs and if we could streamline some of that and find a common way to talk about how people do hit the sliding fee scale or how we can do co-pays or deductibles, it would sure be nice. Mr. Chair? Yes. Um, on uh, the co-pay or the deductible on page one, that could be significant, I would assume. It could, and um, a lot of times people are on, what, when we talk about spend downs, that they have enough income that they don't qualify just outright. They're, they're not so low income that they can just they can just qualify without any changes. So what they have is a copay or a what we call a, a ability for them to have to spend down mm -hmm. their income to qualify. That's the kind of example, though, if, if I can walk you through that yeah. for a spend down, is you can see that the only reason they qualify is that they have to pay first a chunk of money. And you said it could be a lot of money. It actually can be a lot of money. But the great benefit is that they get into the MA service set. Okay. And so you see how we don't want to then double dip that because the only reason they qualify for MA is because they have this spend down. It's big, but it's like a deductible or a copay that you have to get through that in order to get to the benefit set. If we then forgive that, then we've really reclassified the whole qualification process. So it, it, you really do have to work through it a lot yeah. because people you know, come to us obviously and, and are in a hardship yeah. and you want to be generous or benevolent mm -hmm. and you realize you can't compromise these rules because in a, in a sense we're resetting the bar of where people qualify and, and that wouldn't be you know fair to the next person that doesn't ask and so we do hold some structure in place so we don't compromise the the intent of how people qualify but I do agree with you that a lot of times you know they have a thousand dollars that they have to somehow deal with and they don't have a thousand dollars and that's what we face and so we do put them on payment plans we can do that and just not rechange the bar is all that we can do Thank you, Ben. Yeah. I was concerned that people just wouldn't come and it was a great need. Right. Okay. And you know, the other thing, Commissioner and, and rest of Commissioners, Mr. Chair, is that um, we always try to work with people. Like, we're, our goal isn't to try to not have them qualify. Our goal is to try to figure out a way to have them qualify and get what they need. So. Yep. Um, actually, Mr. Chair, that is the action item I have for the Board's attention today. Okay. Purvis moves approval. Brunder will second. Got a uh, motion and a second. Jesse, could you call the roll, please? Commissioner People? Yes. Commissioner Purvis? Aye. Commissioner Brunder? Yes. Commissioner Landcammer? Aye. Chair Stuenberg? Yes. All right. So you got informational stuff for us here. Yes, Mr. Chair, Commissioners, um, some informational pieces. Uh, the first of those being child support. You've seen these graphics, um, I think, uh, for a number of years now and so we kind of track progress and there is some history included in these graphs. Um, I will talk through them fairly quickly because I do want to um, make sure I leave enough time here for Kelly to, to get into some dialogue with you all if you'd like. Um, the first slide you'll see the different bar graphs and or line graphs and the paternity establishment is something we focused a lot on working um, both with um, our child support staff and um, Pat's office through the courts to establish both paternity and order establishment, which is the next one. And we've always overperformed, or for a number of years, overperformed the state average in those areas, so we are very strong. The third graph, you'll see that we are under the state average, and that's been true for many years. You see us. Um, increasing year over year, which has been our goal to increase our collections on current support. And so that's where a lot of our attention has gone. It's really hard to move the dial on those, um, depending on where people are at. A lot of times there's a real entrenchment around what they're willing to pay or if we can find them or if we can't find them to chase some of the money. But we've made a real concerted effort to increase that collections and we want to try to get those at least those two bars to meet. The fourth graph, it's kind of closed, and that's only, I think, because the collection on arrears, the old debt that people owe, we've focused more on trying to get up the um, current support than on arrears, not to say that's unimportant. 
but a lot of times there's chronic arrears, meaning there's really no chance if you look at the case that we even don't know where the person is or they're in jail, you know they're not gonna pay. And so it's, it's really hard again to sometimes move that dial. Um, the fifth graph is cost effectiveness, which we've always been extremely strong on and, and one of the more important ones in my mind, just the um, relative worth or return on investment of our staff and um, our performance in that regard. And then you'll see that there was kind of a V-shaped curve here in the opening of cases and that the last couple of years have gone up. Um, and so that's significant just regarding caseload, but you know, it's um, 60 cases it looks like in the last year. So it's, it's not insignificant, but it's not overwhelming us either at this juncture. Do you, expect, um, yes. do you expect that to go up now with uh, COVID-19? Yeah, and so this has been, this is one of those indicators that is affected by the economy. Obviously all of our financial assistance is, but then child support as well, where people sometimes have a hard time paying their child support. So you see a direct impact of the economy on that and vice versa. When the economy has been good, we've been able to try to capture more of the collections. So there's a direct link between those, those indicators, definitely. Um, let's, just, yes, please. Just for clarification, um, these are cases that are for people who are in public assistance, is that correct? It, it, it includes anybody? those, but it can be anybody. So okay. they can come to us. Um, okay. There might be a fee that they have to pay or charges, but that we are open to um, all incomes okay. in child support. So it depends on how they do that, if they can work it out themselves with the courts, or if they do need the county to be involved. And so we're involved in, a lo in the cases, a full continuum of cases. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, and let me see, then I'm gonna move to housing, so a big jump to the next um, slide. And these, these are really um, dashboard slides. And the first one is about our support, supportive housing. So these are the more transient folks that are on the cusp of being homeless, maybe haven't been as homeless as long. And then the last group I'm gonna talk about are the chronic, more chronic folks that have struggled with homelessness or risk of homelessness. The first um, graph shows uh, the enrollment percentage by household type, and you'll see that we have 133 enrollees or participants right now, which represent 73 um, households in this program. And you'll see multi multiple person households, that's 29, and it w also with 49 children, and that's not on the slide, but Andrew told me that that includes 49 children involved in that. And then single person households in this supportive housing program, 44, and the breakout is just in graphic mm -hmm. form. The next slide gives you some idea, um, which I always think is kind of interesting how kind of evenly spread out this one is, but it's the bar graph that shows the different areas of the reasons why um, people exit. And it's really almost evenly spread out in all the categories that they measure. I apologize for the slide that it cuts off, but this is actually a state-driven slide. We can't adjust that slide, and so Andrew, we put the titles up here in, in the dark, in the black letters at the top. And you'll see, though, just in all these different reasons from death to voluntarily left because of you know four or five different reasons to just refused or just dropped out and we lost them. But it's like onesies, twosies here and there of the 18 that we have that exited and um, for all different kinds of reasons. So uh, it's interesting that they've captured those and that all of those indicators are represented at least by one person. Um, the final slide then is a bit of a shift. So this is the long-term homeless, um, single adults who have been homeless and struggled with this kind of chronically. And, and this is just a straightforward slide of, of what we've seen as far as movement within the program during 2019. Newly enrolled during that year were eight, um, closed four, total enrolled as of 1-1 one, one of 19 was 14, and then at the end of the year, 18. And so these are, are those folks that we've actually struggled with COVID to sometimes stay connected with. Um, it's difficult, a lot of them do not have media or a phone, and so it's harder to practice our safety issues with distancing and or trying to use media in, in lieu of being face-to-face -face with anybody. And so that, that has been a population that we actually have had more difficulty um, as far as staying in touch with those folks. I think we've been able to contact them and be in contact with them, just not as intensely. It used to be more of a day-to-day -day 
connection between the worker and, and the person. So. So that's what I had. Unless there's any questions for me, I'll, I'll turn it over to Kelly Hader. I, I have one question. Yep. Can you just talk about the process as to how we work with the homeless? I mean, I'm assuming rental assistance to a certain extent. Yes. Um, partners? Yes, absolutely. And it's all a continuum of care. And um, Andrew Peach, who are, is our supervisor, has been you know doing this for a long time. But you, you all know, you, um, Commissioner Landcammer, how many years we've been at this from the first pilot till now and watched it evolve. And so um, Hearth um, has been a partner. And you see those contracts come through, which I, I just brought some through in the last month or two. There are um, bills today. Oh, there, yeah, there you go. And so, yeah, that's the reality of the contracts, right? The bills come then. Um, but they've been a good partner to us, there's no doubt. I, I think I expressed to the board that things have changed, and we probably haven't looked at the structure of how that all works for a while. And so I think I'm interested in saying, are we practicing smart? Are there any changes we have to, to, to make? One of the big changes that that has ha happened is a centralized point of intake. So people can come in, it's really a lot of doors, but what it does is it, it's created one funnel. So all those folks, rather than a scattered, yes, it's a major accomplishment in the last you know five to 10 years that this has been worked on. And I still think there's work to do, but I think the centralized intake concept, because there's so many people involved in the continuum of care from partners to ourselves to hearth, that we have to make sure that people aren't slipping into cracks or that one hand doesn't know what the other hand's doing. So that's been a huge addition and that's the best way to filter people in. If it's a housing need for Section 8 or if it's for us, they can sort that out. And there really is no wrong door, so if they call us, we also funnel them back to that same place. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. I just want to add, uh, Commissioner People, but yeah, that what you're saying, Phil, and that was a good question. Uh, and it's good to have that centralized approach. It right. really has helped a lot. It really has. Um, yeah. not, now we just, yeah, it's a constant battle to find the housing and housing that, that, yeah. would, that would Well, work, I'll, I'll try to make a clean segue here to having Kelly come up, but you look at what this response has been to COVID, and we have been at the public health game for a number of years, and I think been very proactive, and uh, <coughs> I told Kelly personally, I'll say it publicly, is I'm very proud of her and her work that she's done with her team. Um, setting a table for something that you know my wife laughs because they use unprecedented so often you know <laughs> an unprecedented um, challenge that we have and it is there's no doubt that this is unprecedented but um, what happens is you see some of the still cracks or the scale and scope of saying what if we have a surge and how would we do that and how would we accommodate this need and all of a sudden the ICU is full. I think housing felt a little scattered like that is where I was going is that there was all kinds of things going on but there wasn't a common way to do this and I think our learnings as time has gone on I'm sure Kelly could expand on that but um, you know, is that we're going to get good at doing this at that highest level of scope too, where it you know shuts down our economy and what that means, and it's going to take us a long time to figure that out. But I hope, just like your commission, like your comment, commissioner, that we'll be able to then be more educated about the next pandemic, even if it happens a hundred years from now, which would be great if it was a long, long time but that we're prepared because now we have some, some history and we have some um, kind of institutional knowledge and in how this stuff works. And, and I think housing felt a little scattered. It was kind of a new thing for a number of years. And, and now it's kind of taken this, this shape where we, I think, have a continuum in place. Public health doesn't feel different to me and I think we're reeling and looking for cracks all the time, but Kelly's just worked extremely hard in trying to be proactive about that. So we are prepared no matter what comes next. And, and obviously we're talking long-term homelessness here. Yes. But, uh, and everything goes to December 31st, 19. Yes. Yeah. So everything from February and March and April is going to blow this thing out of proportion. Right. It's not on here, and I know it's one of some of those emergent funds that they make available is people that are not housed, but what's been difficult for us in that arena is finding those individuals again because of the lack of a phone we often would do this really the street work of finding folks out on the street if that's where they chose to be or if they were struggling and happened to be out on the street we have to go find them that's been our practice but i think even though i you're absolutely right that it blows it out of the water it changes the whole way we look at that that population those people that are experiencing homelessness 
um, I think we've lost some of those folks. And I think the ripple effect, as you kind of indicate, Commissioner, will be down the road. <laughs> that, you know, later this summer and this fall, those folks will be showing up. I hope not in crisis, but I hope we can re-engage them quickly so that it's not a crisis. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Thanks, yep. Phil. Thank you. Thanks, Phil. Morning, Kelly. Morning, Kelly. Morning, Morning Kelly. Kelly. Thank you. Good morning, Chair and Commissioners. Um, it was a great segue as you were talking about um, the long-term homelessness. That's certainly something that has benefited us in the work at the EOC, and I'll talk about that a little later. Um, as you kind of, as Phil mentioned, we, we have been training for this for a long time. So some things are work, have been expected in this response, and some things certainly have not been expected, but our work in TB and tuberculosis and investigations and in H1N1 has really formed those deep partnerships in our community and helped us do a lot of work. And I'm just so thankful for all of our partners in Blue Earth County and the community, um, this board, and all of the folks that I work with. My public health team is, is one of the best you could have. So I'll start with a quick situation update in this rapidly changing situation, which is the other term that we use a lot. Um, as of today, we have 24 lab confirmed cases um, of COVID-19 in Blue Earth County. Our cases uh, range in age from 15 to 74 with a median age of 40. Of the 24 lab confirmed, 17 have been released from isolation um, or recovered. And that can change um, quickly. So one of the, the things I wanted to talk about is essential service provision. Um, one of our uh, mandates as local public health is to provide essential services, which is really ensuring people have food, water, um, access to medical care, um, housing, medications, access to mental health services, and anything else they need to um, live their day-to-day -day life. Currently, we are providing essential services to two households. Overall, we have provided essential services to five. Everything from one household needing just medication delivered. They couldn't go out and get their medication from the pharmacy, so we picked that up and dropped that at their door. Um, to uh, one person at about a seven o'clock at night call that needed housing, food, medication, um, the whole gamut of essential services. And we were able to um, coordinate that and provide that within a two hour period of time. So by nine o'clock we had him a place to stay and food and um, some reading materials with the partnership of our library. And um, it was just an absolutely fantastic um, thing. The Department of Health was amazed at how quickly we were able to respond. Um, we also have um, engaged in uh, work with the uh, Horizon Homes and the cri old crisis center site to have additional housing um, for folks who may have some signs and symptoms of COVID-19 um, to have a place to go if they aren't able to do that isolation or quarantine at home. Um, We've also, I've also been spending a lot of my day at the Emergency Operations Center, the EOC, um, down at the city, which um, is kind of a unique structure. Again, um, we're an amazing region. The city of Mankato um, law enforcement and EMS and county sheriff's department and county public health um, are at the EOC every day. And we've been able to just find so many efficiencies and do so much amazing work um, together down there, we're able to create resource lists and we don't each have to keep a resource list. So where are the masks or the gowns or the um, hand sanitizer that is in short supply and now being sold by the bucket rather than by, you know, sometimes a smaller bottle. Um, we've created funding resources to be able to share with our partners. Um, we collaborate on the personal protective equipment or the PPE. Um, conversations that happen. So EMS, um, FIRE, has expertise as do my public health nurses. So it's been a great collaboration on uh, sharing that knowledge with each other. We listen in on phone conferences together. As you can imagine, there are, there are a lot of those. Uh, Department of Health, Emergency Management, uh, Center for Disease Control. So we are able to um, collaborate on information that we hear in those phone calls and get, um, and as people call into the EOC, we're able to get the right question to the right folks to get a, a really efficiently answer community questions and resources. A few of the specific um, successes we've had over the last few weeks are we've been able to support our non-emergency transportation providers such as AMV with PPE and infection control education, ensuring that there is still infrastructure to get to the doctor um, for a lot of our population. 
And then um, AMB will also be joining our South Central Healthcare Coalition call this Friday as a key partner um, to keep them up to date on all of the efforts that are going on. They are very integral to our plans. So that was a coordination of all of us down at the EOC. Um, as you may have heard yesterday, there was a media briefing and a lot of press on the uh, coordinating collection and distribution of PPE through the Mayo uh, Event Center. Um, getting the right uh, personal protective equipment to the right folks at the right time. And that was a joint city and county media brief yesterday, and um, we are all providing our expertise on how that is rolling out. Um, Amy Holst has been a key partner in helping us with that communication. Um, so in, in specifically, we were able to um, provide gowns. So one of the donations was gowns, and we, Open Door was in need of those. So yesterday, the gowns were delivered to Open Door, which was exciting. Um, we also provided technical assistance to Open Door to, to continue to be able to access um, those supplies. We've coordinated outreach to congregate care shelters, nursing homes, group homes. Um, initially, all of our state agencies were asking us to reach out to these particular entities, so there would have been three or four of us calling, three or four different systems calling and asking very similar questions. And we've been able to um, coordinate that. We now have a Monday call that is attended by city staff, county staff, emergency operations um, folks to check in and see what they see what their needs are, see what their support, what kind of support they need. Yesterday, um, we were able to uh, supply each of the congregate shelters and congregate care settings with thermometers, which are in very short supply right now. If you go into a store, trying to find a thermometer is, maybe there's a couple now, but certainly a few weeks ago there, there was um, none. And now they're able to you know, check temperatures of either staff and or res uh, residents or people staying at their shelters. Uh, other, um, other things we've been in, involved with include the alternative care site planning, um, education and supply of um, personal protective equipment to other um, human service units who have a uh, need to still see clients face to face at times. Um, and we're looking ahead, uh, exploring the communication needs as May 4th comes forward and um, looking at a virtual media um, briefing. And I, it's into our South Central Healthcare Coalition is unique among coalitions in the state as well, where when you see us uh, early on in this, we were up, uh, we had a joint press conference and it was MSU and South Central and District 77, um, Blue Earth County, uh, and then Mayo and Mankato Clinic. That doesn't happen all over the state. We, you know, we look as a coalition and we work as partners and do those media briefings together. So again, people get the, are able to ask the right questions to the right folks and get answers. So that's, again, so proud to live in this community. It's amazing. So, there's much, much more, but I will pause there for questions. Mr. Chair? Yes. Brunder here. Um, how many tests have been performed in Blue Earth County? Do we know what that number is? I do not know how okay. many tests are performed. I'm just curious of the ratio. Right. I can I can find that out though. If you can, that'd be Absolutely. It's an interesting number. And I always like to follow that number from the people that have removed out of isolation to the people we have. So we really only have seven active cases that we know of in Blue Earth County. And so you could compare it to the testing would be a neat number to have. Right. I can I can find that out. And of course when we talk about the numbers that are out there on the website, that's lab confirmed. There's also clinically right. diagnosed cases. Okay. Um, so that does that number does not include clinically diagnosed cases. That's different. Which explain that to me. That's I know, I'm assuming I know what it is, but just so I'm clear. So lab confirmed means they actually had the swab yep. test and with the reagent um, figured out that it absolutely is COVID-19. Um, clinically diagnosed is based on symptoms. Okay. So do you That's have a fever or a I cough? Assume, right. So the numbers that we're seeing, um, the state numbers and stuff, those are all lab confirmed. Those, the ones coming out of the Department of Health are lab right. confirmed numbers. There are other numbers out there about it, it, what they're estimating or what their projections are with the number of people who are sick. So it depends on which set of statistics you're looking at and they usually clearly defined lab confirmed and other. Do you, do you feel that we'd have more lab confirmed tests if, if testing was more readily available in the, in the area? Do, you, do I think that there would be more lab confirmed cases? Yes. Okay. Yep. And how, you know, uh, when we think about COVID-19 or having that illness, it, there can be a range. 
of illness. So some people have had milder symptoms, some people have had um, very severe symptoms and been on ventilators for weeks. So very much like, uh, you know, flu can have the same effect where some people have a mild case of influenza and some people have a very severe case on influenza and these respirators for that as, as well. Interesting. <clears throat> this is just a comment, Mr. Chair, but I, I think that you talking about the relationships that you all have and working together it makes such a difference. Um, so thank you for continuing to build those. Um, you've had them all along, but they're stronger now, I would assume. They are. Um, those, a lot of us were around um, during H1N1, and those partnerships, those relationships that we've been working on since then and before then are absolutely key in just knowing, yeah, working together and, and making. Yeah. And, and just, just a comment, I've noticed online that uh, Walmart was now going to be requiring everyone coming into their store to be wearing a mask. I saw that as well. Um, and I'm not sure if uh, if uh, the state or the county or the city or whatever has that power, but is there any way that we could require other realtors, or, you know, grocery stores, Menards, uh, different places that that do to require them to to have people wear masks? We could certainly look into that in the, the statutes and the community health board powers. And I, I would appreciate that. I uh, Personally, when I walk into a grocery store or I walk into a hardware store, I have my mask. Got it right here. Got mine here too. And, uh, and I wear my gloves, but I'm surrounded by people that really don't believe this is happening. Uh, they, they do not appear that they, you know, they care. And uh, um, personally, I have family members that have heart issues and uh, I, if it's not for my own health, I'm concerned about their health and uh, I don't want to bring anything back. But uh, I, you know, and, and wearing a mask, uh, uh, like it's been shown, is that you don't know if, if you are carrying the, the the virus yourself, even if you're perfectly healthy. Right. Yeah. The virus and can so, be shed. And um, so, I mean, I've had people. Say, I asked them. Says, "Well, where's your mask?" They said, "Well, I'm not sick." So, I I would I would really appreciate you looking into that. Um, <clears throat> that that's that is certainly one concern that I have when I go out and about. Until until we get something figured out with some sort of a vaccine or something that uh, uh, are we are absolutely not going to have it. But as we can cons consistently see one outbreak after another going on, uh, Worthington Sioux Falls down in Iowa, we you know there's there's now a big outbreak up in North Dakota and and uh, until we see something happening. Uh, it should be nice if other people would be uh, responsible enough to, to wear the mask. Um, Mr. Chair, just a question. Um, I know that the Mankato Clinic had a drive-through. Um, I don't know if they're still doing that or not. And, I'm assuming, and I know the, doc, you know the clinic and um, Mayo have done a lot of work internally. Um, so I just wondered if they still have the drive-through clinic or if they're all doing tests internally in the offices? Um, that's a good question. I don't know for sure. I know both clinics, um, each system has a clinic designated as a respiratory care yeah. clinic. Um, mm -hmm. Upper North Man Mankato Clinic is the Upper North Mankato yeah. location in Eastridge. I don't know if they're doing the drive-through model at this point. And I think one of the challenges is there are tests or right. react the, the agent that you need for it. But, right. um, I was just kind of curious because I hadn't heard much about it lately. Right, and the weather is better, so that certainly is an yeah. option as now. And, and that's certainly mm -hmm. something that, you know, we've looked at as public health, too, how a drive-through model of, mm -hmm. you know, if there was ever a chance to, um, they've talked about the mass, you know, swabbing many, many, many people. Um, so we've actually started looking at what would a mass swabbing event look like versus a mass vaccination event, because right now we don't have vaccine. 
um, or any time on the horizon, but there is discussion on that. So how would that work? We go back to meningitis. <laughs> <laughs> because we did the community. Yes, right. Yeah, right. with vaccinations. Yeah. Yep. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for having yep. me today. Mm -hmm. Have a good afternoon. I have a thank question. Is, is there anything we can do to make things easier? Or help? how can we be helpful? And maybe you can't answer that. I'm just... Let me think on that. Yeah. Um, I know we had discussed at one point um, for essential services kits, having a note from the board um, in there just as a personal um, touch to those who are being quarantined or isolated. I know each of the times we've dressed up off as a public health, we have included a handwritten note just mm -hmm. wishing the person well. So that may be, but I can think about other things as well. That's an easy one. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Right. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Kelly. Mr. Chair, I appreciate just coming back up for one more minute. I want to ask a question. I think Kelly can just answer it from where she is. But the question about testing, which I think is a big one, is is there a problem with access to testing? So if I needed a test today, could I get one? Good question. So uh, the last, we are also, part of our responses included sending out health alerts, which we call HANs. Um, and the HAN defines who can be tested because testing supplies are in short supply, whether it's the actual swab or the reagent or one of the components of that test. So um, right now, it, ill healthcare workers, people in congregate care, there are priority um, populations that we want to test to see if it for sure, it, to confirm or not if it's COVID. Certainly, if we have someone in a congregate care setting, we want to know for sure either way. Does that answer the? I, I think Commissioner Malcolm has said that time and time again, and I really appreciate your comments and, and hers about there are priorities for what, because we have limited testing. Um, I think we are extremely fortunate to have her as our commissioner again. Um, She's been amazing. She is amazing. <laughs> yeah. right. And then just the last one, Commissioner, and I will uh, shut this down, but I appreciate the dialogue and the support we get from all of you and staff feel it as well. I wanted to go back, if I could, just to Commissioner Brunders um, talking about how things kind of titrate through. But, you know, there's obviously folks in the community that are asymptomatic that have been exposed but they don't know it yep. so that's the biggest category when we and the reason i'm i want to share this to see if we can all agree like this is how we kind of look at the different pieces because as we hope for rather than a surge but a, a re-engagement of how do we get back into business so to speak um, i think we need to be aware of these risks because they all present a little differently. So the asymptomatic folks that have been exposed is the biggest group, like using kind of that, that piece that you defined, Commissioner. The next one would be that they have been exposed to the virus and have a virus, but it's undiagnosed. And so they're sick, but they don't even know they're sick or they're ignoring it. And some about your mask question is, so, so you could be asymptomatic and exposed, you could be ex exposed and have the disease and not really know that you're that sick because your body isn't um, exposed. There's different levels of exposure and you are able to fight it off, but then you can infect so many other people to the commissioner's point. The third category is this clinical, doc, or self-diagnosing. I am sick, I'm staying home, but it has not been lab confirmed. So that's the third category. So asymptomatic, then presence of virus, then this clinical, um, status that, that there's something going on you can see the symptoms but it hasn't been confirmed by a test and then finally the fourth category which is MDH as our core metric so these are all our analytics but our core metric is we standardize how we measure things and MDH is going to be that final standard of saying this is how we're going to bonify how much we're looking at but it's a much more stringent thing it's lab confirmed test so I just wanted us to say if we have language for that I'm Kelly educates me about these different things and what fits in each category all the time daily and um, I just want to make sure I'm passing that along so as we sort we don't confuse what we're talking about the risk the big risk 
the titrated risk down to level three or the lab confirmed risk. There's no doubt statistically, what we were taught in school is that you can take, once you have a standardized metric, you can extrapolate the math from that to the population. There's no doubt about that, that yeah. that works. And that's Fauci and all these folks, that's what they're doing. Yeah. But there's this other reality that, that Commissioner Brunner was talking about that and the masks, wearing masks, that's about this other reality that we have to acknowledge as well. So thank you very much for your time. Can today. I ask one more question, which is totally off the subject? <laughs> How's the teleworking going? Oh, I, I think it's going very well. We're um, very well represented. I think Angie did push out some information to Josh yesterday that's that's published, but I think we're at 75 or 80 percent of folks at least are partially deployed to yeah. telework. So, I mean, wow. the building is pretty empty <laughs> when you go there. And um, I think that's good news. That was, you know, too. this kind of respect for what we're up against and people aren't aren't um, congregating, they're just not. And so it's very successful in that way. We've had some, you know, expected glitches with IT and IT has been extremely responsive where financial workers, uh, you know how you get dependent on things. We, we came from a place where we didn't have computers in my lifetime to having a screen to them needing, and I'm saying needing, two screens. And so we, we went from saying, no, you just get one screen at home and it didn't work. And so we had to upgrade that and get them two screens at home and now it's going well. So. You know, we've lived and learned, Commissioner, is what I would say about teleworking. And um, Bob and I have talked, I, I don't think we'll ever fully go back, you know, because you prove what really works well. The clinic was a little tough getting some of the prescribers who maybe didn't feel comfortable on the phone or maybe weren't as versed as like a Dr. Farnsworth might be with, with some of the telehealth but they've been pushed into that reality. And so I think it's really a good thing, but it hasn't been painless. And Bob and I were talking before the meeting is that it takes its toll over time. You know, we're not feeling like we're in a normal rhythm. And so that stuff is creeping in, but the telehealth to your question, I think is, is really going well. And we've been highly successful at that. That's great. Yeah. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. Thanks, Kelly. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for all your work. Yeah. Tell your staff, too, how much it's appreciated. All right. We're going to go back to administrative services. Uh, Bob? Mr. Chair and Commissioners, the first item is the county board minutes for April 7th. I'll move approval of the county board minutes. This is Line Cammer. People second. Got a motion and a second. Jesse, could you call roll? Commissioner People. Yes. Commissioner Purvis? Yes. Commissioner Brunder? Yes. Commissioner Landcammer? Yes. Chair Stuenberg? Yes. Next would be the bills for the two weeks indicated. Purvis moves the bills. Brunder seconds. Got a motion and a second. Uh, are there any uh, discussion on, on the bills? Any discussion on the bills? Jesse, could you call a roll? Commissioner People? Aye. Commissioner Purvis? Aye. Commissioner Brunder? Yes. Commissioner Landcammer? Yes. Chair Stuenberg? Yes. All right. We'll go right into human resources. Bob? Uh, Mr. Chair and Commissioners, I have number four in your packet is the Human Resources Department agenda. I have one action item for the board today, and that is uh, authorization to initiate recruitment for a program coordinator in our disease prevention and control area. As you just heard from Ms. Hader, our uh, D disease prevention and control area is a very active area currently. Um, as a part of the uh, COVID response, we have received $95,000 from the state of Minnesota to support our efforts. And so uh, this position would be actually a, a promotional opportunity for one of our uh, current <coughs> disease prevention and control staff with a backfill behind that to, to follow. Um, part of the reasoning we're bringing this forward is, as you've heard, Kelly has been very active in the work um, of uh, the disease management. Um, she also has roughly 25 other staff that she oversees, and so we need to get her back into a supervisory role. We also have the issue of our tuberculosis um, monitoring that we have been doing. You've heard from staff in the past about uh, the workload there. And so having uh, COVID come on top of the workload that already was um, kind of at capacity is requiring um, this request to come forward to provide some additional 
um, support and uh, resources in that unit. Line camera moves the action item. People seconds. Got a motion and a second. Any discussion? I just think this one's critical. It, it just shows how important mm -hmm. um, we that, that we have to put resources into public health right now. This is you know something that we certainly didn't expect, and I think personally they really were busy with the TV section, mm -hmm. and now you add this on top. Um, I think it's something we absolutely have to do. It is a specialized area, so yes. you know when we think about could you just move another staff person from another area, the nursing component here is uh, a critical element, and we do not have that capacity in house. Do you foresee this continuing even after the COVID nineteen is done with? Um, I think we need to evaluate that, um, and so the backfill there is some. Um, question whether we'll do that as a permanent position or a temporary position. Um, the Human Service Department, quite frankly, has been promoting uh, this sort of request for some time. So uh, just with tuberculosis and some of the other responsibilities in this particular area, the ongoing need may very well be there. But I think we need a little more time to figure out uh, where things are at and how the virus is going to continue to impact us. So if we pass this, would we put it out as a temporary position? This particular no. uh, position will be an internal promotional opportun opportunity. So this one would not be temporary. This would be a permanent role. It would be the backfill that we would think about yeah. that. Okay. So we do have employees that could be looked at for this. For this particular role, yes. All right. It's the backfill that we may not. Right. That still would have a nursing component to it, and so that's why it would be kind of a specialized recruitment, but that would be the area where we'd evaluate whether it should be a permanent or temporary uh, recruitment. All right. Thank you. I think um, I've had numerous calls with NACO about um, legislation that, that is moving in Congress. Um, as I understand it, um, any funding for um, state and local governments is probably not going to make it in this next uh, alliteration. Um, but it shows how local governments are the front lines, counties are the front lines. And um, I think, I don't know if Congress actually um, gets that um, because we are the ones doing the work. Um, and this is where the resources are being expended. So. I find it interesting. Somebody like to give a motion? Oh, I'll move. I did. I moved. Yeah, we did. We did. That's right. Any more discussion? Jesse, could you call the roll, please? Commissioner People? Aye. Commissioner Purvis? Yes. Commissioner Brunder? Aye. Commissioner Lankamp? <coughs> Aye. Chair Stumberg? Yes. And then we have informational. Yes, Mr. Chair, uh, we have filled a 911 dispatcher position, um, and we did uh, receive then a resignation of a financial assistance specialist. So um, we've uh, initiated recruitment to refill that position. We have a change in employment status for a probation officer, um, switching from a temporary to a, a permanent position. And then uh, we've initiated recruitment for a mapping specialist. All right. Be happy to answer any questions that the board might have. Mm -hmm. That's all I have, Mr. That's Chair. That's all you have. Well, then we will Thank go you, right into our um, commissioner reports. Commissioner Landcammer, you want to start us off? Sure. I would love to. Um, <laughs> Actually, I seem to spend most of my time on conference calls um, lately. That um, seems to be the, the only way we're all communicating. So um, on the 7th, I had Region 9 orientation. Um, since um, you've um, been kind enough to give that to me this year, um, so they You're oriented. Welcome. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you. Um, I, they orientated me as to what's going on. Um, 
on the ninth um, mm -hmm. conference calls with AMC as to what's going on, Senator Klobuchar um, work on the aging population and I also had a long conversation with Mike Laven um, about um, what's going on with um, their housing and some of those things on the ninth. On the 10th, um, I sit on the Region 9 um, Transportation Advisory Committee. Um, we had a Zoom meeting. Um, all of these practically were Zoom meetings um, that were, uh, and we approved MnDOT's transportation plan. Region 9 has various things that they have to do in that transportation for MnDOT. A lot of it <coughs> is convening and working with people. Um, on the 13th, I was um, on a Zoom meeting um, when the EDA at the city of Mankato made their decision as to who was going to do the project down by Cub and um, the Children's Museum, that project. They decided to go with Cohen Estry, who had applied three years ago, but their, um, their project was much, much better and much more much more engaged this time, so um, that's who's going to be doing the building down there. It'll be interesting to see what happens with housing with the COVID-19, you know, is there going to be money from Minnesota Housing Finance Agency, all those things. It's a national group, so um, they probably have some resources that other agencies might not have. Um, on the 14th, he's not here right now, but um, MSU did their civil engineering um, design presentations um, where they do two projects every year and um, our uh, engineer, uh, Ryan, helps with uh, those uh, students at MSU. Three hours, interesting as all get out. Um, they do different projects and this was, one was the downtown Mankato doing bridges um, that open things up for people mm -hmm and got them across um, various roads. It's always interesting to listen to. Um, on the 15th, I was on a conference call with, for inclusive recovery with local governments, um, and then a White House briefing later in the day. Um, on the 18th, um, which is a Saturday night, of course, we find out from NACO that um, 3.5 is coming up and we need to contact our, our senators and our congressmen. Um, I did the two senators, and I know Mark did the uh, congressman. So um, we all worked hard. Um, I, maybe not successful, but um, it, lots of conference calls and um, texting and um, information. Um, yesterday, um, I had a Southern <coughs> Minnesota Housing Partnership meeting where we talked about um, kind of some of the proposals for the area that the nuns own up at Good Council. So some mm. interesting things going on there. And the nuns want to make it a community um, project. And so they're sending out information to anybody who's ever gone to school there. I'm one. And also to the neighborhood to see what the neighborhood would like to see happen there. Um, and then a NACO update um, later in the day as to um, where we're sitting. Right now it looks like the legislation's got um, money for businesses, small businesses, and um, hospitals, which is so needed, and then testing. So um, those are good projects. Um, so we'll see what happens if they pass it. That's all I have, sir. All right. Mark? Uh, let's see. Well, let's see. Kip and I did on the uh, 8th, uh, had our MICA a meeting, Zoom meeting, and uh, seemed like it was quite well attended uh, uh, by phone or computer. And um, uh, the big thing was that uh, everybody was, they were talking about abatement, what, uh, what we would do. Uh, it, it was a far-ranging subject, I guess, how, how it went. <clears throat> Nothing conclusive. Um, then uh, Friday the 17th uh, actually had uh, All Seasons Arena, we had our meeting, and uh, that was Zoom too, and that uh, dealt with um, uh, the rink and with uh, various issues with the school district and such, and um, uh, that was productive. 
um, I guess and then as um, Colleen said this weekend um, yeah I did uh, engage the congressman several times actually um, Hagedorn and uh, um, it's funny I don't know it's funny but uh, uh, this day and age they seem to um, uh, you, you have to negotiate and then you come up with this package and you, if you're uh, just a congressman or a senator that's not involved with the nego it, it's kind of like uh, you take it or leave it and you see too much of that it's not deliberative like it used to be I don't know I guess it's been a few years but it, it's uh, don't like that but because so you get them where they think yeah it's not, they don't have a problem with that, but we have to look at the whole you know what are they going to come up with and then uh, and then then you get to some of that partisanship too like what are you, you know so it's yeah and like clean Commissioner Land Cameron said that you know the uh, yeah it didn't become part of it for the states or for the counties issues counties and the local governments where yeah this is the I, somebody used the word boots on the ground, whatever, but that's yeah. where it is, yeah. Yeah, so. yeah the, um, the negotiation is all being done by... Just the people, high level, yeah. yeah two yeah. people from the yeah. House and mm -hmm. two people from the Senate yep. and the White House, and, and, and um, yep. that's pretty much where it's going. Yep. And like I so said, the congressman would have a hearing uh, or have a, a conference call, like it was Sunday, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. and from the minority leader, and of course I'm sure the other do it from a majority, whatever, and yeah. Anyway, we'll see. I guess that's my report, Mr. Chair. All right, Commissioner Purvis. Okay, um, still getting used to doing business with uh, on the phone and by email yeah. and stuff. Yeah. But I've been in contact with um, the executive director of Detox. Uh, we stay in contact on a regular basis, and so far they're doing very well. They haven't had any COVID cases, and uh, it's kind of business as usual. They're they're busy. Uh, which is not a surprise. Uh, they did they did lose one full-time employee, and they're looking to replace that employee. But other than that, uh, detox is is running fairly good. Um, emails and phone calls with the uh, extension office. Uh, they're working on choosing the farm family of the year for Blue Earth County. So, kind of excited for that. But we don't know whether there's going to be farm fest, county fairs, or anything like that. So. Stay tuned uh, as that develops. Um, on the 16th, they had a webinar um, with the AMC uh, Public Safety. We had briefings from um, the Commissioner of Corrections. Uh, uh, he gave an update on uh, the COVID-19 in the prisons, and uh, they they do have cases, but it sounds like they're they're managing. Um, had a briefing from the um, uh, Joe Kelly, the Director of Homeland Security and Emergency Management, and he detailed what uh, what's going on with those folks. Um, had an update for jails and law enforcement from Bill Hutton from the Minnesota Sheriff's Association. It sounds like uh, they're doing quite well. Things are, are working well in the in the jails and that type of thing. And then we heard from the probation officers how they're handling that. Uh, Jason Anderson from um, Itasca Probation and um, uh, Midge uh, Christensen from uh, uh, Director of uh, Community Corrections. So uh, um, a lot of stuff going on. It was good to uh, good to have those updates, and uh, we'll can continue to do business this way. Yeah. Thank you very much, Commissioner Brunder. After the last board meeting, Commissioner People mentioned already that we had our MICA meeting, and yes, a lot of discussion about property tax, uh, deferrals. Uh, it was all over the place from not doing anything to waiting till after the taxes are due and doing something. Uh, just, just a lot of discussion. That was probably most of the meeting, but had a good, good update from the rest of the staff also. And then I had my SWCD meeting, which was a call in, and uh, they're just doing business as usual with the rest of us, the conference call. Uh, there were some technical difficulties on some of it, but they got, got it all in pretty good, and I gave our report uh, as far as what we had going on here. And we had a lot of discussion about how we're gonna start handling public hearings. Yeah. Because uh, at some point, we gotta figure something out here. We got ditch stuff out there, we got planning and zoning stuff out there, you know, and, and they had some interest in those. 
and so uh, we are working on that and so there was a lot of discussion with when I gave my report on that specific item then we had an MRCI call in also a lot of things going on at MRCI unfortunately this is uh, not uh, going to be a business as usual even when this is over it will take months to get this up and running uh, from what I understand the buildings are are billed a month behind so even if we get up and running for a month it's still going to take months to get in we did get some federal help uh, from the PPP loan from what I understand uh, was uh, 3.5 million dollars I believe but again that doesn't go very far in an operation like that to keep us up and running um, so Brian and his leadership team are really working with some different organizational structure how they're going to deal with things uh, long term not just as short term but how we're going to get it back up and running and what's going to happen after it's up and running again so a lot of things going on there and at the end of the day it's just an organization we have to have in these communities these uh, the services uh, MRCI provides is very valuable and so we need to get it back up to 100 percent and that is brian's goal at the end of the day how we get there is might look different than what we have now but that is his goal and he is committed to that uh, i had mvac meeting last night a conference call uh, i went into the office with social distancing and made the call from there because i had to sign the documents for the grants uh, a lot of head start stuff there's a lot of head start grant coming money coming in for some covid stuff uh, obviously they're changing up the platform a little bit trying to get uh, some summer summer programs going but unfortunately our staff has to spend all this time putting this together and then we might not even have it come summer so uh, a lot of work for the staff but at the end of the day it's something we need to do because these kids uh, are going to be out of you know listen a couple months of school now so they could make that up come summer and if we can get a grant to pay for it uh, but a lot of logistics trying to get a grant like that together from what they told us yesterday was it's not as simple as just saying well, we're going to have a summer reading program we have to figure out how many people can come how many want to come how are we going to get them there i mean totally different program so uh, chris and her staff are working diligently trying to get something put together we did not uh, approve that grant last night uh, because we just don't know what the numbers are yet but as soon as we get them we'll approve that and we're very supportive of that operation moving forward obviously as the as the board and then I've had several miscellaneous uh, ditch calls. The uh, water is still running. The pipes and sewer or the lines are still breaking in the ditches. And with the fall or the, the snow, snow melt, they're starting to get, get exposed. So I've had several calls, and Ryan has been very active out trying to deal with those for me. So that's my report, Mr. Chair. All right. Mr. Chair, can I ask a question? You can ask. And I don't think anybody can answer it. Um, <laughs> can we do digital signatures? when you talked about going into the office um I, I just think it's a question that we might want to think about for what that's worth Person. i used to do digital signatures all the time at usda well mr chair and commissioners i, I think that is an option in certain places yep. i think it is a question probably better directed towards our federal and state partners because we're usually the ones sending stuff in requesting yep. uh um a either reimbursements or grants or whatever and so it's their rules that really drive that but um certainly um in some cases the state has gone to an electronic system entirely for mm -hmm. some of our grants so it is a signature free sort of system in some cases but it it really depends on the different programs involved it's just a different way of doing business absolutely and, and i think it, it might be worth looking into at least yeah yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. All right. Well, my uh, report itself is rather short. As, uh, as most of us, we have our meetings that were canceled or put to uh, Zoom, or uh, I had a few that went to Google Meet, which, is, which was another download that I had to put on there. That, uh, I think my iPad is getting filled up with different meeting solutions mm -hmm. that, uh, that we, we use. I've had almost daily, if not two, three times a day, calls to the administration in reference to the COVID-19 issues and what's going on in the county and what's going on in the state uh, and how it's affecting the county. So I appreciate Bob uh, either answering my calls and getting me the answers as much as he can or, or else uh, or calling me back and letting me know what's going on. Uh, it's been very good to have that, that close relationship. Um, 
uh, April 14th, I had a uh, TDS, uh, Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund, uh, meeting to approve programs. Uh, I'm sure Will remembers those well. Uh, we met on Google Meet. Um, uh, How's the flow of uh, grant dollars for that? Is that holding steady? Or? Uh, so far, Good. I think some of it is coming from what happened before this all happened. So I can only imagine what's going to happen sure. in the future. Um, on the 15th, I had a Rural Action Caucus call in. Um, of course, uh, again, COVID-19 is the big issue and what's going on in the rural counties like ours. On the 16th, I had a TDS board meeting on Google Meet, and actually we had 18 people on there. Mm -hmm. So it was a pretty big meeting right on uh, on you know, on Google. Uh, yesterday, I had a magic me meeting on, uh, again, I'm not sure if it was on Google or what it was on, but <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I log in, it gives me there. So, uh, uh, I, and I don't think I have to tell you, everybody here what's happening with, uh, um, you know, stocks and bonds across the United States. It's, it's not a pretty thing. Uh, I've had a lot of people talk to me about uh, how their uh, retirement fund has gone down. I said, just hold on, you know, if you can. Um, and then again, yesterday I had a talk with Bob and on, on the meeting agenda. Um, so that's that was basically mine. I would uh, thank everybody for watching this morning, and uh, if you wish to uh, tune in to the um, work session, it will not be on live stream, but will be on. Uh, uh, you can listen in using your phone, and you can get that number by. Uh, down, by going to the Blue Earth County website and looking at the uh, the 21st work session packet and the phone numbers on the bottom along with the access code. So thank you very much and uh, I'm looking for an, a motion to adjourn the meeting. So moved people, so moved. Perfect, seconds. Got a motion and a second. All in favor, oh, I can just say for all of us, we're on live stream. All in favor, say aye. 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 Against, we're adjourned.